Hey YouTube, JP Dillon. I picked up this uh, Nico NR515 at a junk store and uh, just wanted to see if it was worthwhile. As you can see, the uh, base knob is broken off and I do have the knob. So we're going to come up with something creative to get that knob back on there. But that's only if the set's really worth repairing. I've not powered it up and I really don't know what its condition is. So the first thing that we're going to do is hook it up to a load in an oscilloscope and see what it does or doesn't do. All right, so I got it hooked up to my scope and a load bank back here and my signal generator. Also notice the power switches here is pretty loose. Let's put it on auxiliary, make sure every all the tone controls are at neutral, and let's see what happens. Well, I can tell by the flickering light that we most certainly have a dying power switch. That's very common of these things that have the uh, combination speaker selector power switch thing. Most of the lamps are out. So in most cases I would just pass on this one because it's kind of an entry level one that really doesn't mean shit. Um, you can see there we go, we finally got our full power there. But we're going to go through this one and kind of mess with it anyways. It also appears that the tuning meter is stuck, probably because somebody got rough with it. But if I turn the volume up, you can see, although the pots are noisy, I've actually got two channels that work. Let's find out how well they work. Turn down the sensitivity and turn it up. There's our clip point there. So that's actually a reasonable amount of power. Let's see how much. Alright, so we're putting out 12.8 12 volts RMS into an 8 ohm load. So the way that you calculate your power output is you take your RMS voltage and square it and then uh, you divide by your resistive load. So in this case 12.8 squared divided by 8 roughly comes out to just a little over 20 watts per channel. So I'm 20 on the right, 20 on the left. Which uh, isn't a bad thing. That's great for most small rooms, bedrooms, offices, an apartment where you got people that are easily annoyed at your music. So the next thing we have to do is uh, go through the machine and see what's going on here. The reason why the voltage is fluctuating is because the power switch is uh, fluctuating. The resistive contacts in the power switch are pretty much trash. So let's get the machine open and we'll go over the aspects of repair. So here's the Nico opened up. And as you can see, it's not really that cheap of a thing. Rather than some integrated circuit amplifier, you do have two independent left and right channels with discrete components. You've got a three gang variable condenser for your tuner, which isn't a bad thing. You've got an all discrete phono stage back here. Uh, so it's really, it's not a terrible thing. I'm just going to move it, turn it around here. It is somewhat light because of the smaller transformer. But you can see it, it's your standard issue, ALPS, push button switches, and pots. Uh, it does use uh, an HA1196 and an AN217, uh, which I believe uh, this is your uh, AM, FM, slash multiplex, and this is your AM radio. Uh, or actually, I could be mistaken, and this is the... FM and this is the multiplex. I really don't remember. It's been a while since I knew all of these chips. But here is the uh, power switch speaker combo. This is fairly common in a lot of sets. Sometimes you'll see this one and sometimes you'll see a gray one. Now if you see this one, they're really... it's too much of a pain to get apart to really resurface the contacts to a usable point so we can either uh, hose it with uh, some really strong contact cleaner and pray that it works uh, or it'll be bypassed and we'll put something in the line instead uh, the time running it the heat sinks were of 
equal temperature. There's not a hot spot anywhere, which is good. So really, uh, what I want to get down to is fixing the disabling failure, which is obviously the power switch. We'll chemically treat all the rest of these switches and controls underneath here. And then we'll see what consistency our power switch resistance is to determine whether it's fixed or not. If you turn the thing on and off 20 times, and you know 15 of those 20 times the resistance is questionable, obviously it's trash. Uh, but if you turn it on and off 20 times, and 19 out of 20, or 20 out of 20, it's good, there's probably a good chance that it will last a little bit longer. So, um, let's get the deox, and we'll hose the switch. And I also need to repair it, at least reattach it to the front panel because it's kind of loose. So uh, let's get the front panel off. And on these front panel removals, pretty straightforward. You just kind of yank the knobs. There's usually some hex nuts behind them. So far it looks like this one's only going to be held on by screws. Yeah, so uh, in that case... On the bottom, we see three screws there on those gray tabs that need to be removed. And on the top, we've got a tab there, and we've got a tab there. So loosen those two screws, and we should be good. And then we can get to the important stuff behind this. So I'm going to remove those screws and pop the front panel off. Here's the set with our front panel off. And you can see the cheap aspect of this is that this is a plastic front panel with just an aluminum plate to cover it. So that's where your entry level is right there is that plastic and the plexiglass. Maybe we'll clean that up depending on how things go. Uh, here's your loose power switch. That hex nut needs to be undone. Uh, with a busted off shaft like this, this is the opportunity you want to take uh, to prep this for repair. And what I typically do is I'll take a drill after flattening this with a grinder or something like that, I will drill a tiny little pilot hole and uh, we'll drill the tiny pilot hole a little bit bigger and a little bit bigger and a little bit bigger until we have enough for a self-tapping screw. And then the self-tapping screw will be close to the diameter of this, not exact, but close. And then I will cover the screw in heat shrink tubing to grab the knob uh, so that we get the proper protrusion and uh, actually are able to use it. Short of replacing that pot, that's really your only choice in that matter. Uh, but I am curious right now about the power switch, and it's even more interesting that it's got Loctite on it, and it still is loose, so I wonder if this was struck or hit or something like that, and that's why it's cranky. But for the most part, these switches just aren't very good to begin with. So once you get that loose, just go ahead and push it in there pick up and turn our set and really the purpose is just to get it a little more accessible uh, let's take off the headphone jack as well since it's all attached together that will hopefully give us a little more freedom of movement they are obsessed with Loctite on these and yet they still come apart Since they have a regular washer here, and that they probably have a lock washer behind it, but we'll find out. Nope. All right. So go ahead and yank your speaker selector switch free. And you can see that everything is held together by a screw here and here underneath this resistor here. That holds the whole wafer stack together. And you obviously... Uh, what you can do if you really want to take the switch apart is you can grind off those little rivets there and use screws in the end to hold it back together. To make a lasting repair, that's really what we want to do, is pull that switch apart. So that's what I'm going to do. Uh, I'm going to set the camera down momentarily. We're going to remove these screws, pop the switch off the back, grind the rivets down and open the switch up, and then you can see how cruddy they get and how to clean them up. Here it is with the switch apart and as you can see uh, really the culprit is yeah, yeah that's easier uh, really the culprit is is this little striker area here 
you can see that that contact is pretty worn and that contact there is pretty worn so what I'll do is I'll scrape the carbon off and then I'll try to take a burnishing stick or a fine piece of sandpaper and just polish those two so that they they mate better uh, which really requires some fine work so I'm gonna do that real quick clean this all up and then clean the interior out get rid of all the carbon this happens because a it's a crummy switch but b because people load down the accessory outlets with some huge thing that draws like five amps this is a three amp switch it's just not meant to do that there are plenty of these out there that still work fine but the abused ones are evident by what you see here and they just get really crummy so once this is all cleaned up uh, we'll put it back together and then you should be able to uh, see when I take the ohm measurement that it's all happy again but uh, let's clean up the contacts and then I'll show you what it looks like after okay so here's the switch a little more cleaned up and I, I polished the mating surfaces there and tried to flatten them out as best as possible and nominally when we get our meter it has a very good resistance meeting I'll get some alligator clips and you can see what I'm talking about alright so here's the switch open Got 0.6 ohms 0.6 ohms it's very consistent and when I wiggle it it doesn't change it's got good contact in there uh, we can do this a bazillion more times and very likely it will all stay the same so this switch is fixed as long as he doesn't load down the accessory outlets uh, the person using this uh, will very likely the switch will last quite a while so now what we need to do is get it back together and since they're very tiny screws uh, or pop rivets that hold it together we need to find some small screws that will hold it together now uh, which isn't impossible so I'll put the switch back together and then we'll get it all back into the front panel all right so here's our switch I'll put back together I use some self tapping machine screws to hold the body together I put a strap around it to reinforce the clamping force because oftentimes when you trap these out the uh, plastic if it's old and brittle gets little cracks in it uh, this one had very tiny cracks so I just wanted to be sure so I put zip ties around it and I glued it and of course the camera is not going to focus but it's ready to go back onto the uh, shaft and then we'll put everything in and turn it back on again and see how well it behaves all right so now we got our switch and stuff back in Let's see if it actually works No flickery lights no more. Cool. I like it. Alright, so now let's focus on the second part of this disabling failure, which is the busted off control here. Uh, I'm going to take my Gremmel and grind off the flat spot, and then we'll see if we can uh, drill a pilot hole and get a tapping screw in there of some kind to make a post for the knob to go on to. So let's get to that. So really you just want to make this as flat and uniform as possible. I've just got a cutoff wheel that I'm just going to lightly press up against here. Try to make this as flat as possible. That's pretty good. So now I'm going to get a tiny drill bit and we're going to drill a little pilot hole in that thing. Nice and slow and easy. Alright, so here's a 1 16th hole. I'm going to center that best to my eye and start real slow.
Just take your time and drill it out. You can even use cutting oil if you have it. Alright, so that's about a quarter inch. And now we'll get a bigger bit. Alright, we're going from a 1 16th to a 5 64th. Again, nice and slow. Okay. Come on, focus. Just thinking about it. There we go. So we got a nice little pilot hole there. I might make that a little bit larger. Uh, let's see. Might have an eighth of an inch. Let's see here. All right, so I think an eighth of an inch might be a little too big. Uh, I'm just going to stick with this size, and then we're going to use some self-tapping screws to thread it and get the ones at the appropriate length with a head on it big enough that I can build up with shrink tubing to fit this knob on. Uh, so let's get some screw candidates. All right, so this is the longest miniature screw that I have that will fit in there. So what I propose to do is... Uh, Maybe find a little sleeve or something to put around this and glue it in place that's close. Uh, and then heat shrink the rest so we got something to fit the uh, knob onto. So let me get some stuff together here and see if we can put something together that works. In trial and error, I found a uh, probe cover that I cut down to size. I cut the head of the screw off and uh, I put some uh, Loctite on here. So I just need to screw this on here, since I've already measured the length and everything. And then that sits at about the right height, so that when the knob is on it, it uh, sits at the other heights pretty perfectly. So then all I'll do is I'll put some glue on it to hold it in place once I gather uh, what position I want the knob to be in, and that'll do it. And that will give us a functioning knob again. So, uh, the next thing we'll focus on is cleaning the switches and controls, uh, which is fairly easy on this, and dusting it out and replacing the lamps. But that will be for part two. We're going to wrap up part one today by just fixing the disabling failures. Uh, we now have a functioning power switch we've repaired the shaft to the point where we can install a knob on it. Uh, I don't know what I'm going to do about this tuning meter. Uh, it looks like it's been struck or something from behind. It's pretty pretty messed up. If I mess with the needle bearing a little bit, as you can see, I can kind of get it to, to get back into place. So I don't know. Maybe we'll uh, heat it up and see if we can get the plastic softened enough to work. It centers now at least, but we'll see. And then once everything's working correctly, then obviously we'll focus on cosmetic things like the lamps and shining it up. But anyway, that's part one of your Nico NR515 uh, repair and rescue. Thanks for watching. More to come soon.